sailor out on the Great Lake Sea. Just another sailor, his destiny to meet. Just another sailor, his name was Dennis Hale. Working on the freighter, the Daniel J. Morrell. The Daniel J. Morrell was a 603-foot-long Great Lakes ore carrier that sunk on a strong Lake Huron storm on November 29, 1966. Although her story of sinking, which was seen eight years prior with the Carl D. Bradley sinking in Lake Michigan, her story of survival is quite mind-blowing and how the man Dennis Hale survived more than 38 hours on a floating raft in Lake Huron. Now let's get into the Morrell statistics and get into her sinking. The Daniel J. Morrell was built by West Bay City Shipbuilding Company. She was launched on August 22, 1906, and had her maiden voyage on September 24, 1906. At the time, she was the Queen of the Lakes, an unofficial title given to the biggest ship on the Great Lakes. It was still well known throughout the Great Lakes, though. Anyways, she measured in 603 feet long, 58 feet wide, and 32 feet deep. Her operators at the time were M.A. Hanna Company, and she would stay under their command until 1926. From 1927 to 1929, she would be under the command of Cambria Steamship Company. And from 1930 all the way to 1966, she would be under the command of Bethlehem Transportation Company. She had a max crew of 29 members. Now let's fast forward to November 28th, 1966, one day before the Morel would go down. His mother died when he was born, left him quite alone. His father couldn't care for him, he'd drift from home to home. In and out of trouble, as though driven by the gale. It was November 28th, 1966, and the Daniel J. Morrell was departing from what I believe was Buffalo. But if not, please tell me in the comments. It was very hard to find where it departed because of the research or lack of research. But anyways, the Bethlehem Transportation Company, just like what happened with the Bradley, was not satisfied with the shipping season result and requested one last load and transport from the crew of the Daniel J. Morrell. And actually, the Edward Y. Townsend was with the Morrell and was asked to do one last season run also. As the Morrell was leaving port, crew member Dennis Hale was late to the point where he missed the Morrell and just watched it slowly sail out of port for what could be her last voyage, or what would be her last voyage. Dennis Hale would go back at home eventually trying to call the Morrell and find a meetup spot where Hale could get on the Morrell. The Morrell left port up for upbound St. Clair and out into Lake Huron and for Thunder Bay. At this time, the Morrell in the Townsend were close by the top of St. Clair River, eventually exiting. There was another November witch at this time forming in Lake Huron, and it had seemed like the Morrell was going to be caught in the hands of it. But actually, a few hours ago, the Townsend made the decision to take shelter in St. Clair River, leaving the Daniel J. Morrell and her crew all alone in Lake Huron. But then he came to work and sail on the Daniel J. Morrell. Like a wave out on the storm-tossed sea, driven by the gale. The Daniel J. Morrell was out on Lake Huron taking on November storms when, and she was holding strong. Well, at least that's what her crew thought. Dennis Hale, a crew member of the Morrell, was in his cabin at the time of the Morrell's fight with the storm. He was being woken up constantly by the sound of the Morrell's anchor slamming against her hull. This went on for a while. Eventually, after a while of this sound, an even louder sound came up. Dennis Hale obviously thought this was once again the anchor, but maybe it could have been dropping. But still, the sound was loud enough to the point where he had to check what it was. At this time, Dennis Hale was barely dressed up appropriately for the weather conditions. That would come into play later. Anyways, when he got up to deck with just boxers on and pretty much no clothing, he saw the back of the morel bouncing up and down with the waves. Then he realized that the aft end of the morel was not there, well, was not where it should have been. The morel 
had just broken up into two pieces on Lake Huron, and there were still men on the aft and forward end of the section of the morel, including Dennis Hale on the forward section. The crewmen of the forward end of the morel got the raft ready when they launched it. Four men, including Dennis Hale. <clears throat> I couldn't find other names of the men because I couldn't find any sources that said the names of the other four men. If you know, please comment below. Anyways, four men got onto the raft, watching the morel just hog with the waves. The aft men of the morel surprisingly was still with her engine power, so that meant the morel's aft section was moving on its own. We will pretty much never know what happened to the men in the final hours of the morel's aft section. The aft section would go for four more hours of, until it eventually sunk into Lake Huron. Now it was just the forward section of the morel, which was rapidly taking on water, eventually sinking. Now it was just Dennis Hale and three other men on the life draft, who, which one of them was pretty clothed appropriately for the weather. The men fought through the cold hours of the night. They all went to sleep on the raft with all four barely fitting in. In the morning, Dennis Hale woke up. He woke up to finding out that two of his friends aboard the raft overnight unfortunately died of the cold because it was too much for their bodies. Dennis Hale was trying to wake them up, but like I said, they passed away in the night. Dennis Hale then shouted to the bottom of his feet to see if the other man was still alive. And there was a response. Dennis Hale was relieved because if the other had also been claimed by November's Fury, Dennis Hale would have been all alone in Lake Huron. His crew friend said that he was able to make it through the night and survive, except he had told Dennis that his lungs had felt like they were filling up with something, most likely blood or water. His lungs must have been crushed by something while trying to escape the morale. Hale had told him to cough it up and that might just help him, so he did so. A few hours later, he eventually died. That is another claimed by the Fury of the Lakes. Now it was just Dennis Hale all alone in Lake Huron. In the night, a voice was heard, and this is what it said. Go back and tell the story. Go back and tell the tale of the men who lived and worked and died. I'm the Daniel J. Murray. The Bethlehem Steel Company noticed that the morale was overdue for location report. At first, they ignored it, thinking that the morale had just simply lost power in the storm and were not able to communicate. As we know, that wasn't the case. After a few hours of the morale being overdue, the company began to grow concerns for it. They, became, they started becoming concerned, so then called out Coast Guards to begin a search for the possibly sunken morale. They launched the search helicopters in hopes to find a survivor. After so long, they had finally found a life raft with four men in it, <clears throat> with one of them being, a.k.a. Dennis Hale, being alive. They pulled Dennis Hale over to the helicopter, and all he could say was thank you, blessing them that he had been found because he didn't think he was going to make it out alive. Dennis Hale was simply happy to be out of the situation. Dennis Hale, at one point in the survival, tried to choke himself to death because he didn't want to be alive, nor did he want to be dead. He just wanted it to be over. Dennis Hale was taken to a hospital later to recover from his bad conditions. Despite having few clothes on, he made it out alive, and many believe that's why he survived. Because with clothes on, he would have stayed cold for a longer time, giving him hypothermia, killing him. After the incident, he stayed quiet about the disaster, only telling the Coast Guard about it. After 25 years of quiet, he said that it was enough staying time. No, I'm sorry. He said that it was enough staying quiet. So then he started telling people about his experience, writing a book about it, going on in interviews, etc. In September of 2015, he died after losing to a battle with cancer. Dennis lived a nice and peaceful life after the shipwreck and the 28 other men are not forgotten. Thank you for watching this episode of Short Great Lake Shipwreck Documentaries. I'm everything Lake Freighters. Subscribe if you like Lake Freighters. Have a good day or night depending on your time of watching. Goodbye.